At this time, I'd like to introduce Glenn Arnold. Glenn is a field specialist focused on manure nutrient management systems with Ohio State University Extension after having served as a county educator for 22 years. So Glenn um, will now start his presentation on making maximum use of nutrients in liquid manure. All right, thanks, Amanda. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, what we're, we're going to do is spend some time uh, uh, on what our efforts are in Ohio. We're attempting to create new windows of time to apply livestock manure in Ohio, try to get away from that late fall application window and the uh, summer application window following wheat. Uh, I'm going to discuss today some of our small plot research results, then I'm going to move to our on-farm research results, and then I'm going to wrap up my presentation with a uh, new toolbar we're using to apply dairy manure to standing corn. Essentially, a lot of the um, interest in Ohio has been with water quality issues in the last few years. This is the eastern end, or excuse me, the western end of Lake Erie. Uh, we call it the Lake Erie Basin. Uh, essentially, um, you can see the green that's all through here. This is algae in the 2011 year. Uh, this is the Maumee River comes in here through Toledo into the western Lake Erie Basin. And the algae issues uh, were really intense in 2011 similar to what they were many years ago in the 1960s before we began to reduce the phosphorus that's been going into uh, Lake Erie. Unfortunately, uh, phosphorus numbers were going down until 1994 when the amount of dissolved phosphorus going into the lake uh, has begun to go up, go up. And it's been an issue uh, several times in the last several years. This is just a close-up view of uh, what the algae looks like in uh, not only Lake Erie, but this has also been a problem in uh, Grand Lake St. Mary's in western Ohio and other inland lakes in Ohio. Uh, not all are connected to agriculture, but many of them uh, agriculture is often looked at, looked at as a possible primary culprit. Now, I always like to show livestock farmers this slide uh, just because when we start to talk about water quality issues, uh, non-livestock people almost immediately focus on manures as primary sources of phosphorus leaving fields. Uh, this is Iowa State University data from several years ago. They had 21 fields that they looked at. And I just wanted to point out early that commercial fertilizer actually was leaving the field at a faster rate than the manures that uh, were involved in this research project. Again, the gray uh, line is the uh, total phosphorus that was leaving the field in the runoff water. And the black line is the dissolved portion of that that was leaving. And again, I always like to throw that out just so uh, audiences understand that it's not just a uh, livestock issue, no matter what state you're in. When we work with livestock producers, we really want them to take uh, manure tests and understand what's in their, their manure. If they'll understand that, then they'll be more willing to look at ways to utilize that, make maximum use of it. Uh, whenever we do manure tests in the state of Ohio, the labs come back with a total nitrogen number, and I just have three examples. Here's a finisher building on the right, a nursery here in the center, and a finisher on the left. And you can see the numbers are vary quite a bit. And so manure uh, nutrients do vary quite a bit from farm to farm and building to building, but they will be very consistent from year to year out of the same facility. At least that's been what I've experienced. So when we look at this, in Ohio, we get this manure available nitrogen number. Uh, that we use when we're trying to uh, use the nitrogen manure with corn or wheat. And essentially, the way this number is arrived at is the labs simply take the ammonia portion, which is readily available to crops, figure about half of the organic portion will mineralize over the crop season, and that's where you end up with the available manure nitrogen number that we use. Also, you can see our P205 down here, which again, we always have to be cognizant of uh, how much we're putting on uh, what we're looking for, those types of things. This is just um, the tanker that we use this year. Um, essentially, uh, we use tankers for uh, uh, to tickle the fancy of the farmers, get them interested in using livestock manure. To uh, put manure on a tanker and haul it, you're probably, if you look at the uh, Minnesota Manure Distribution Cost Analyzer, probably looking at at least two cents a gallon to do that. And uh, we can do it more cheaply with drag line hoses. We didn't know that.
but uh, again, we use them just to uh, get farmers thinking about this whole process. And when you do use them in our tanker, you always want to calibrate it, uh, actually make sure all of the uh, uh, Dietrich uh, uh, applicator uh, rows are unplugged, those types of things. So we always spend some time calibrating uh, each year that we want to work with this type of equipment. I'm going to talk about some of our small plots first. This is a small plot uh, research farm uh, that the university is a part of. Uh, and here I've applied a half inch of dairy manure to pre-emergent corn. So the way I do my research plots on the, on the, the university-owned property, um, if they planted this corn on a Monday, I'm in there by Tuesday or Wednesday to do the pre-emergent uh, manure application. And the reason I picked a half inch in this instance is that's the uh, maximum that could be applied because that's the water holding capacity of uh, Hoytville clay soils. And that's, uh, that would be our limitation. This would be an example of post-emergent applied dairy manure. Again, this is that half inch rate on corn that's already emerged out of the ground. Um, really surrounds it, really looks tough and bad. And, that's why we do it on research plots, not necessarily out in farming fields. Uh, we learn to do it to gather information. And if you go back and look at those uh, plots uh, a week later, uh, you'll see that uh, surrounding the corn with dairy manure like that uh, did not uh, cause any, any issue with it. This plot is also post-emergent corn the same day. This is, this is incorporated dairy manure at a rate of uh, 13,000. 577 gallons per acre. Again, that half inch that we're looking at. This is the results of three years of small plot data. Now, each of these are replicated four times each year. Uh, our nitrogen amount that we used each of the years that we're talking about, 2001, 2000, or 2011, 12, and 13, each year, we aimed for 200 units of nitrogen so that nitrogen would not be a limiting factor. And we were just wanting to do these side-by-side -side comparisons. Now, on the dairy manure that's been applied here, that again, we were using the half-inch rate. On the swine manure that was applied, um, the rate came out at just a little bit short of 5,000 gallons per acre. And then the 28 applied, of course, was to meet the 200 units of nitrogen in the non-manure strips. I would uh, point out a couple things before we talk about the yields, and that is that on the line that I'm looking at where we had incorporated dairy manure and surface applied dairy manure, in both of those instances, the dairy manure would only provide me approximately uh, 10 units of available nitrogen in 1,000 gallons. So in both of those instances, we had to supplement the nitrogen with 28 to uh, reach the 200 units that we wanted for each of the treatments, and also down here below the same thing. Everything above the green arrow right now, all of these are pre-emergent plots. So that the manure and the 28 was all put on before the corn broke the surface of the ground, usually within just a few days of planting. All the plots below was where the manure was put on approximately a month after planting. The corn was in about the two-leaf stage, which is fairly common for when most people do side dressing in northwest Ohio. So we have the pre-emergent plots at the top, the post at the bottom. Over to the far right is a three-year average of uh, 28 versus incorporated swine manure versus surface applied swine manure versus incorporated dairy manure versus surface applied dairy manure. And then down below the same way on the post-emergent plots, with the exception of the very bottom one, which is a zero nitrogen check that we had in place. Now, two of the three years were very dry. The 2011 growing season, you can see there's humongous difference in yield between the manures and the 28, and that held true for the post plots as well. And essentially, it just showed that that little bit of moisture that's applied when dairy manure is uh, incorporated or swine manure is incorporated, if the, growing the, seed, if, the, if the drought breaks early enough, that little bit of difference makes a, a way of a difference on yield. In 2012, the drought stayed with us pretty much the entire growing season. There was still a nice bump from the moisture provided by the uh, the manures, and also possibly from the fact that the ammonia was in a more available form when it was applied. But the results were, were pretty interesting to see. And uh, the, the purpose of it is to, again, show farmers the potential uh, that manure has. If we could have put that on a growing corn crop instead of uh, just applying that late in the fall, 
like uh, many people currently do. So again, uh, dry seasons really favor manure, and uh, these results have been uh, a lot of fun to work with. We're going to try to con continue it for a couple more growing seasons uh, just to see if it continues to pan out. The 2013 year was, was a very good growing season for most of us in Ohio, and uh, even then the manure performed very, very well. Whether, again, that's the moisture that's been added or whether it's an indication of the, uh, uh, the effect of, of the Dietrich toolbar going down through the center of the corn row, which is you know, a bit of a tillage effect, I uh, can't really be sure. But uh, again, uh, we're interested uh, in just showing farmers the potential uh, if we can figure out ways to better utilize live, livestock manure. Switching to the on-farm plots, um, we also take a tanker and we uh, try to do uh, as many as 12 to 15 on-farm plots around the state of Ohio as we possibly can. Uh, essentially, um, uh, we work with finishing buildings to try to reduce any issues with disease transmission. Uh, this is just an example of us loading up uh, the tanker and uh, getting ready to head to a field uh, in Dart County in western Ohio. I always put this slide in when I talk to farmers because the 28 applicator can be a little loose once he's driving down through a field and the corn still emerges. You can see where that 28 applicator cut right through there and the corn still looks fine. Uh, you cannot drag a, a, a Dietrich toolbar through a field like that and get away with it because I'll, I plow out quite a bit of corn if I don't stay pretty straight and narrow. I'd like to tell you that all of my plots are straight and narrow just like this, but again, we do have uh, uh, with auto steer, with uh, GPS, potential. I think we have a lot of a uh, very bright future ahead of, uh, of this. And again, the on-farm plots are primarily to expose farmers to the potential. Um, I try to get new farmers each year just to get them stewing and thinking about using manure as a, as a side dress or fertilizer source for corn. Um, one thing that did help us quite a bit this year is we switched from these 8-inch sweeps that are kind of standard on uh, Dietrichs. The company uh, sold us these five and a half at, uh, at uh, their cost of production, which really uh, helped us quite a bit. Uh, more corn survived, me going through the field with, uh, with the, tr the tractor. And if, uh, Leslie, if you want to play that first video at this point. This is just a video that shows the, uh, uh, what the process is. Uh, essentially, the county educator for Dark County is in the tractor. I'm shooting a video on this one and uh, we've got a six row applicator and uh, the farmer planted with a 12 row planter and we basically uh, uh, go down and back and we try to match the nitrogen the available nitrogen in the manure with the amount of nitrogen the farmer would have side dressed with anyhow so if he likes the side dress with 150 units that's 28 percent we will try to match that you can see the closing wheels that we have behind the Dietrich and I think the closing wheels are very very helpful uh, to conserve that nitrogen, keep uh, keep uh, uh, keep it available for the corn crop. Uh, you shouldn't be able to smell it when we leave the field, and essentially that's kind of the way it worked out. When we do these farm plots, they're all replicated four times. Uh, we try to do a um, um, that way. It gives us uh, you know statistically some pretty good numbers to work with. Leslie, will you have to close that? Yeah. So essentially, we had pretty good growing seasons. Um, we're pretty happy with the results. Again, we've been doing this for five, six, seven years in Ohio. Um, I'm the first manufacturing loaned us a seed runner. Although many of our farmers have the uh, GPS capability, the uh, yield monitoring equipment, that's great. If they didn't, then we provided a uh, method of, uh, of measuring the grain and the moisture and that type of stuff at the end of the year. These are the results from 2013 on our um, uh, on-farm plots. Um, as I look across there, essentially most of them there was no statistical difference, and that's kind of what we expect. If we're going to put about the same amount of nitrogen on with the manure as we do with the uh, 28, then, um, then we would expect them to be the same. And most of them are. There are a couple that are excuse me, statistically different. Uh, I would point out the second one from the right is the Raider plot in Hancock County. Uh, again, the, the uh, source of manure was much lower in nitrogen than what the initial test that the farmer had provided turned out to be. So 
So essentially, in that example, I did not put as much uh, um, nitrogen on with the manure as what they did with the 28. And um, likewise, in this one with the Alley Farm uh, in Mercer County, the uh, manure test came back higher in nitrogen. And because we had such a good growing season, the higher amount of nitrogen you had, the uh, better the reward. The only one, other one that was different that I would point out would be this Herod plot. And that was primarily due to damage to the field. Uh, we, we caught that field just at uh, spiking time. And we had to wide sweeps on the tanker. That was the very first plot we did that spring. And basically, it was from stand reduction that we got a difference in, uh, in the corn yields. Now, again, we try to match the nitrogen needs. And, and statistically, if uh, we do that, then with most of the hog manure that we've applied, uh, we are just about matching the two-year needs of, uh, of uh, phosphorus and potash for a corn soybean rotation. So even though we are on a phosphorus uh, uh, scale in Ohio, and that's what we look at first, the potential is there that if we look at nitrogen and apply as needed, uh, we've got a lot of potential to do that and do it right. So we're pretty happy about that. I store all my... Uh, results each year at this website. And uh, each of the plots will be written up individually. And uh, comments will be made on those. And you can go back uh, to 2008. And the early years will be more wheat plots. The later years will be more corn plots. And again, our goal is to get farmers to think about this. Because long term, I think the potential is that we're going to be able to drag line um, this uh, manure on this corn early in the growing season. Uh, rather than use a tanker. The tanker, again, is just to get them thinking about it. But I think the future is going to be switching to a drag line. And I have two farmers who are going to try that this growing season. So we're really looking forward to that. 